morning, my friends. We're back. Mastering Diagnostics, video number 10 with me, yours truly, Brandon Steckler, technical editor of Motor Age Magazine. I got to tell you, I got asked all the time when I was in the shop, and even more so now that I spend more time uh, offering technical support or instruction. People say, Steckler, how do you do this stuff? And, and sometimes um, the ones that aren't aware kind of look at me like I'm some kind of magician. And I'm not. Um, I, there's nothing I do that any of you can't do, but I do have to tell you, uh, two things come into mind when, when we're talking about, uh, the success of, I, the successes I've realized for myself over the years. One is truly understanding how things work. And second, just as important as the first is practice, 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 practice. And when I say practice, I mean, practice on cars that aren't broken. What does that mean? That means taking time and, and, and you pick a particular system on, on the car you're working on. Let's say your own car or, or your wife's car or your mom's car or your friend's car or a coworker's car. Stay late after work and take some time to perform some experiments. Okay, so how do we go about doing that? Well, step one is doing some research, learning to leverage the power of your service information system to gain insight onto how a component works individually, but how it works in the system. In other words, what are all the players in the game? So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to do this mastering diagnostics in a, in a mini series of three. So this will be, of course, this is video number 10, but this is number one in our series of experiments calling I'll call it learning how to learn. So we are going to begin first and foremost today with an ignition system, firing a spark using a three-wire cop coilover plug system. Um, in a later video, we're going to cover a fuel injector. And in a third video, we're going to cover engine mechanical. So in this video, again, we're going to focus on spark. And I'm going to show you how I go about educating myself. So many years ago when I spent time in the shop learning how to do this stuff, why did I waste time doing that? People looked at me when I was nuts. Stecker, what are you doing? The car is fixed already. Or why are you staying late to do this? You don't need that stuff. Put that scope away. That's We don't need that. Um, now, the time I've spent investing in myself and, and, and my own personal education, all these tests that people call uh, advanced or people call weird or wizardry, this is a piece of cake. These are second nature to me. I can do these in my sleep. I'm not showing off. I'm telling you, a little bit of practice does make perfect. So stick with me through this video. I'm going to walk you through how I went about learning. And I want you to take this back to your shop, and I want you to do the same thing. And I want you to teach the younger techs how to do the same thing. Get them started off on the right foot. Because, my friends, it took me 25 years to get where I'm at today. I want to be able to take somebody fresh out of school and have them surpass me in five years or less. And they can do it if they get started off on the right foot. So stick with me through this, and I'll walk you through how I went about educating myself. So what we have here is the wiring diagram for my 2006 Honda Civic ignition system. And I want to take a moment to explain what's going on here with all these pretty colors on the screen. I learned this technique from a good friend of mine out in California, George Menchu, the president of AES Wave. Um, George, very intelligent man, came up with this system for color coding wiring diagrams to make it easier to view. Now, as far as this ignition system wiring diagram is concerned, it's relatively easy to stare at. It's easy on the eye, so there's no real need to color code it if you don't want to, but I did want to demonstrate the technique. Let me explain the colors. First of all, red represents battery voltage or hot at all times. I look at red like fire, very hot. Orange, not quite as hot as red, but still hot, would be voltage when a switch closes or a relay closes or a transistor closes. Ground is green like the grass. We'll have that in green here. And yellow is not quite like green, but it still represents ground. So ground when a switch closes or a relay closes or a transistor latches will be colored in yellow. And I will color a load device in blue, something that does work. So let's use these colors to analyze the diagram. We've got battery voltage available at all times at terminals two and four of the ignition coil relay. When the ECM provides a ground path for the ignition coil relay coil, 
the coil, the load in blue becomes a magnet and it latches the switch side of the relay. So battery hot, hot at all times in red becomes battery switched voltage in orange because the switch closes. That provides voltage, switch voltage to all four ignition coils at a single splice. And on the ground side in green, all four ignition coils are provided a path to ground via another splice leading to G101. What you see here in purple, which I did not write here, I have purple I chose as a switched input to ignition coils. So the ECM PCM is going to output a voltage and then take the voltage away. When we put the voltage there, the coil is going to latch and turn on and dwell and take on energy. And when we take this voltage away, that energy is going to dissipate and that magnetic field is going to collapse and it's going to induce a spark. Where did I learn that? I learned that from service information. I'm going to show you that next. So let's take a look at service information, system description and operation, and see if we can understand how this ignition system works. So we can implement that, that service information and, and create experiments that we can learn and get practice. Setting up the vehicle, uh, approaching the wiring diagrams, implementing the test, and learning from the data we captured. So referencing only one of the four ignition coils, because they're all going to function the same, we just really need to stare at one. Um, terminal number... 15 of the PCM is what provides the control on that purple highlighted wire to the ignition coil, the coil over plug unit. So the yellow and green wire is the one we're going to be referencing, and that's labeled as ignition pulse number one. What is its purpose? To drive the number one ignition coil. How do we anticipate the signal looking? With the ignition switch on, it should be about zero volts. And with the engine running, it should have pulses on it. So it should turn on and off and on and off. And we are going to be considering that when we reference the terminals of the ignition coil on the vehicle with our lab scope. And the reason why I want to use a lab scope is because the lab scope is going to tell a story. Because it has multiple traces, each one of those traces is an aspect of system operation. We are going to see the command, right, the pulse here going to the coil, and we should see a reaction. We should see the coil turn on. And when it turns on, that's the work that's going to be performed. We're going to be using an amp probe to monitor that. So back to the wiring diagram again, we are going to concentrate or, or utilize, I should say, all four channels of our four trace scope. For, again, so we can see the story being told. Now, um, three channels here are going to go to the coil itself. I'm going to have battery feed or a switched ignition voltage, I should say, um, on the black and white wire with my red channel. My green channel is going to be referencing ground on the black wire. And my yellow channel is going to be representing the pulses coming from the PCM to turn the coil on. Now, the work being performed is going to be measured by our current probe. And the current probe is going to be affixed right here at a convenient spot in fuse number 18 of the underhood fuse block. The reason I chose that, A, is because um, current is the same anywhere in a series circuit. So we could measure current here or here or here. We could measure it at the ignition coil itself. But the reason why I put it here, uh, again, A, is convenience. But B, I get to see all the activity from all the coils. So current flowing through this coil is going to be visible. But in turn, this coil, this coil, and this coil. So we can see the work being performed for all four coils throughout the entire engine cycle, all from one location. We get a lot of information. And we also get to see the functionality, the entire story being told for ignition coil number one. So we'll head out to the vehicle, affix our scope, and capture the data. So I'm out here at the car and I'm freezing my butt off because it's cold outside, but let me show you my setup here. Channel red is going to be referencing battery voltage at the ignition coil. Channel green is going to be referencing ground at the ignition coil. And channel yellow is going to be the signal from my PCM to my coil telling it to turn on and off. And over here on my blue channel is my amp probe referencing the blue fuse for the ignition coils to operate. All right, let's get right into it. So the first thing I'm going to do is separate my channels. 
I am going to put my green trace, my ground trace, down at the bottom. And I'm going to put my voltage trace at the top. That's just my preference. And I will put my command trace in yellow in the middle and my blue current probe trace on, on top of that. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is try to clean these up a little bit. And by implementing, by implementing a filter, I can get rid of some of the noise we see here. Noise is normal to occur on a scope. Um, scope is a very sensitive device. And getting rid of the noise allows us to analyze some finer details of the capture easier. However, you must be careful when you implement a filter, especially something as high as 6.2 kilohertz. Um, when you implement a filter, you are technically erasing or telling the scope to ignore some of that pattern. So you could destroy a perfectly good waveform if you filter too much. But I have enough experience to recognize that we see everything we need to see on this screen. So the first thing I want to point out is vaulted supply to the coil is 14 and a half volts. That's because my alternator is running. Ground supply to the coil never deviates above ground much more than maybe 200 millivolts. So that's a good strong path to ground. And we've got our command signal of about 4 volts on this vehicle. And of course, our current trace showing the work being performed. So I'm just going to zoom in a little bit tighter to show one complete cycle and let it fill the screen. And a couple of things I want to show you. First, each and every one of the four coils is doing about the same amount of work. If we had a coil that was unhealthy, it would show up in this pattern here typically. Um, but look at how the scope tells the story. First of all, we've got a strong path to ground and a vaulted supply. When the PCM commands coil number one on, it's going to send a, a four volt square wave out to the coil. When the square wave is high, the transistor inside the coil latches and allows current to flow through the primary windings. And then when the five volt, or in this case, four volt reference is taken away, the transistor unlatches and the coil ceases to dwell and discharges a spark. So that's the story being told. Now, some other free information here. You always hear me talk about Ohm's law and lots of people roll their eyes when I start talking about physics and I get it. You know, we're technicians, we're not physicists and things of that nature. But listen, it truly does apply. Um, when it comes to Ohm's law, that's the relationship between current flow, resistance, and voltage or voltage drop. Even a wire has some resistance in it. So as the coil is commanded on and current begins to flow, voltage begins to drop. Let me zoom in a little bit more here. As, as the... As the uh, Current begins to flow, voltage begins to drop. And the same thing happens right here. If I pull this over here, we can see as current starts to flow, the voltage on the ground side starts to lift. Again, a voltage drop is occurring. Totally normal to see that. However, if there was a problem with coil current, we would then have to look at our voltage and ground supply to make sure they were adequate. So again, this tells the entire story here. And this is what I mean by practicing what you're learning with your tools, how to implement them, referencing the wiring diagram and service information, learning how to do this stuff. When you go out there and practice on cars that aren't broken, you eliminate a lot of headaches for yourself. Because when you work on cars that are not broken and you come across a problem with the scope, for instance, it allows you to more focus on your technique and your setup rather than wondering, does the car have a problem? And am I seeing the problem? Or is there really no problem at all? And I'm just struggling to learn how to use the tool or to perform the test correctly. See, it's not that hard. Learning how systems function, how components function to work together with other components in a system, is the key to diagnostics. That's step number one. Because if you don't understand how it works, there's no way you're going to anticipate what your test results 
are supposed to be. And when they're not what they're supposed to be, what are they trying to tell you? How is that going to take you closer to fixing the vehicle? So simply implementing um, these advanced testing techniques, which I put quotes up because um, they're not really advanced. They just take some practice. They give you lots of insight how the system works. Being able to implement them means nothing if you don't know how to anticipate the results. So again, my goal today was simply to empower you to leverage the power of your tools, leverage the power of your service information system so you can become a self-learner. And when you get ahead of technology and you understand how things work, you become a very powerful tool in the shop. And again, this is video number one in our series of three ignition systems. Join me next time, and we are going to be referencing something very similar, but we're going to follow a fuel injector. And again, I want to thank you all for joining me in this episode of Mastering Diagnostics. I'm Brandon Steckler, Technical Editor of Motor Age Magazine. We'll see you next time.